Okay, colleagues, greetings and welcome back. Hopefully we are live. So, um, today I was planning to talk about Foucault's ethics and more specifically um, Foucault's uh, later work, especially associated with the course that he has taught in the Collège de France, um, course known as the Hermeneutics of the Subject. 1981-1982 course. Um, now, <laughs> having said that, let me immediately go back one step and explain. Um, to a very large extent, this is going to be a bit of, um, you know, just talking out loud, thinking out loud. In an important sense, what I'm doing here and now could be characterized, I guess, as a form of a philosophical diary. Um, very much, very much uh, a work in progress, very much just me trying to um, get some thoughts out, get them out into the open, into the public. Now, um, a diary is an interesting thing. Diaries are supposed to be personal, right? Um, but philosophical thoughts, I feel, uh, uh, benefit from this. Uh, um, um, I mean, I, I don't, it's like, what's the right phrase? I'm under no illusion. Of course, most people, it's like very few people actually watch these uh, videos, these streams. In fact, uh, most of my students, I would imagine, don't watch these streams, but that's okay. J just the very fact that these ideas are out there into the open that I am speaking in principle, in principle, not in reality, but in principle <laughs> to the whole world, um, puts me under an obligation to formulate my thought with a certain kind of uh, clarity and precision, which again, a private diary, the kind of opportunity that a private diary just does not provide, or you know, neither does um, a letter to a friend or just a conversation with somebody you know, who's a friend or a relative. Um, so kind of I'm trying to do two things at the same time, which are pulling me into, in different directions. On the one hand, <laughs> Ideally, this would be a lecture on Foucault's hermeneutics of the subject, uh, uh, but <laughs> on the one hand, but on the other hand, like the, the other direction into which my intention is pulling me is just no, this is not in any shape, matter, or form a lecture. This is just me thinking out loud. So, uh, uh, is this going to be completely chaotic? Uh, you know, is there going to be any structure, any conclusions? It's hard to say. And I'm going to, you know, at the end of the day, hopefully somewhere in the middle, maybe. Um, and I mean, ideally, ideally, I, I kind of wanna wanna think uh, that. Mm, well, first of all, some of the thoughts I have um, about Foucault, I, I think, are very relevant um, to the courses I teach, and actually, I would imagine to uh, any student who's taking my course. In principle, what I have to say, I hope, would be of some use, um, both in terms of you know, like analytical content, information, conceptually, but maybe just in terms of you know, uh, uh, stimulating your thoughts to maybe think outside the box a little bit, or maybe give you some ideas for, you know, for your projects, presentations, or essays, or even maybe courseworks. Um, on the one hand. Um, on, on the other hand, uh, yes, these thoughts are, are stimulated by the courses I teach, and, and they do, one way or another, refer to the topics that we are studying um, together. But actually, more broadly, in principle, I hope that this may actually become a course. I'm not ready to teach this course just now, <laughs> but uh, um, um, having recorded um, my, uh, you know, the, the, the lecture series for Coursera over the, over the summer, uh, the recording has finished approximately in August, uh, and, um, you know, since then I've been quite busy uh, teaching and <laughs> grading, and sort of uh, now, this is this is my customary time of sort of slowly, gradually beginning to wake up uh, uh, to um, sort of regain consciousness uh, after the very taxing months of uh, 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 the winter exam session um, and sort of you know right about now you know, second or third week of February is when I when sort of uh, 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 the, 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 the sense of being alive gradually comes back to me and I begin to ask myself, what the hell am I doing with my life and what should I be doing um, in the future? And so actually, you know, um, having, had some, having had just a, a tiny little bit of free time um, over the past couple months, I was uh, um, just walking around my house, just thinking about 
um, what, what, um, what are the topics, who are the thinkers who really interest me. Um, and of course, Michel Foucault is very important. And uh, um, especially, again, this book, Hermeneutics of the Subject, I, I do want, you know, despite the chaotic and somewhat um, autobiographical nature of this very unstructured narrative that I am spinning right now, nevertheless, I do hope to uh, get at least some thoughts out with respect um, to the book, Hermeneutics of the Subject. But at the same time, I don't just want to start from nowhere. I want to set the context um, a little bit because my relationship to this book um, um, is um, deeply personal. This is a very important book for me. Um, and actually, there are kind of many angles of attack. They're all intertwined. And I, I do hope that these thoughts are important. Again, maybe they're not even important for you, my dear listener, but hopefully they are important for me, and I just want to get them down, down here for the record, so that, you know, hopefully when I'm going to, you know, because I do have some aspirations to maybe actually develop this into a course precisely on the hermeneutics of the subject, and I want to, you know, make it explicit as to what leads me to this book. Um, so I may or may not come back to this, but again, uh, uh, to a very large extent, this was, again, the, the lecture series that Foucault taught at the Collège de France, 1981-1982, um, were biographically extremely important for me. I was, um, actually, ever since I began to do philosophy seriously, Foucault was a guiding philosopher for me, a guiding thinker. And as I, di as I studied the <clears throat> classics, uh, uh, like the, the basics of the philosophical traditions, um, which I did, uh, you know, one way or another, while I was, let's say, shopping for a topic to specialize in, uh, again, reading Greek philosophers, classical European philosophers, reading philosophers outside the West, such as the Indian tradition, or, for example, the Chinese tradition, or, or maybe, again, talking about the ancient, you know, as the ancient Greeks pass on to the Middle Ages, uh, um, you know, the um, uh, Christian, Jewish, and Muslim thinkers who, one way or another, are, to a, or at least to a large extent, are trying to square the uh, legacy of... Uh, Plato and Aristotle with the revealed, with the traditions of revealed religion. So whenever I was studying all of this, right, Foucault has always been, for me, a, a guiding thinker in, in the way I approach any topic in philosophy, any topic in philosophy whatsoever. And of course, the main course that I have come to now teach, modern political theory, uh, with Hobbes, Rousseau, Hegel, John Stuart Mill, Marx, and Nietzsche, right? So all these philosophers I, I have read through the prism of Foucault. Um, so much so that, again, well, I say modern political theory is probably the most important course I teach, but there's also another course, which is uh, kind of um, clo in close second place, which is the course in philosophy of science, which I have to say, unlike my uh, a modern political theory course, I would say my philosophy of science course, philosophy of the natural and the social sciences, is very much a course in the making. <laughs> this year, sort of having finished recording the uh, Coursera lectures for the social and political philosophy, I sort of wanted to do some kind of a pass uh, recording the lectures um, uh, for the philosophy of science course. And I kind of realized that I do have a lot of um, draft work. There's, there's a lot of topics I want to cover and to discuss with students, but they are not ready to be delivered as proper lectures. In many ways, that course exists right now in the form of a preliminary seminar. I do think that there are some important uh, intermediate conclusions, but it's not a finished course in any shape, matter, or form. Um, and um, so, but, 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 at the same time, uh, uh, I would say that more or less the only lecture I'm happy with um, in terms of this course, Philosophy of Science, is the, f is the first lecture, which is available here on the YouTube channel, which I think is still the kind of the um, channel trailer or something like that. It's supposed to be like the title video that uh, uh, anybody watches who just clicks on the on the um, um, channel page, right? And to I, I explain there why I think, again, that this uh, transition from the teleological to the mechanistic worldview, I think, is the most important transition in all of human knowledge, in all of human intellectual endeavor, period, 
and how Foucault, I feel, um, Foucault nar more narrowly, but broadly speaking, the uh, French post-structuralism, right, um, as a certain kind of a reception of uh, the legacy of, let's say, you know, uh, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, right? So Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, uh, uh, in terms of their reception within the French post-structuralist thought, meaning first and foremost, Foucault and Lacan, for me, and maybe also to some extent Jacques Derrida, right? Um, how I see this as centerpiece for understanding our place in the universe. Uh -huh. uh, this uh, phrase I borrow from Max Scheller, uh, it's uh, uh, Die Stellung des Menschen im Kosmos, the, the place of man in the universe, was ist der Mensch, right? What, what is the human being fundamentally? Again, this trying to build up this picture from protons to presidents and from electrons to elections, which is um, to some extent kind of an interesting enterprise because the French post-structuralists just, you know, lets me uh, uh, refer to them briefly and easily. But at the same time, of course, this is a thought, uh, this is a term, post-structuralism, that has to be taken <laughs> with a tablespoon of salt because by and large, you know, none of the philosophers actually accepted this uh, label, postmodernism or post-structuralism. Um, but, but still, so what, I, what I'm driving at is, of course, this grand narrative of a unified picture of the world from protons to presidents, from electrons to elections, this, you know, uh, uh, worldview which is expressed in terms of a single concept, transition from teleological to the mechanistic worldview. Of course, this kind of uh, uh, unity and uh, um, kind of this uh, kind of a single grand, single unifying grand narrative seems to be completely antithetical to their project. Um, which is, you know, which is there as a tension and as a problem. And I want to, I, I, I guess, acknowledge this, this tension and, um, and what's the right phrase, uh, to, to, to live up to this tension. So, like, not, you know, at the danger of trying to talk about everything at the same time, um, I feel that we both need some kind of a unified worldview like this. And at the same time, of course, after Lyotard, Lacan, and Foucault, we can never be completely comfortable with, a, with this kind of grand, unified, um, ambitious, you know, singular worldview. So, uh, you know, it, it is a solution with a certain kind of like an internal check with, with an internal breaking mechanism built into it. It's a solution, but it's, uh, I'm not sure if solution is the right phrase. Um, you know, it, it, it is uh, not really a solution. It's more of a working hypothesis, I guess, right? Uh, a working hypothesis, like a um, working model of the world, uh, hypothetical description of the world as it works, you know, again, as it hangs together from protests to presidents. But as soon as you frame it, as soon as you bring within this general formula philosophers such as Foucault, uh, Lacan, and Derrida, um, this kind of worldview to some extent has to necessarily point to its own limitations. To, you know, to some extent undermine itself, maybe yes, undermine might not be the best word, but sort of uh, to, to, to limit the pretension of its own ambition. Again, this um, issue that we that keeps cropping up in class after class after class. Again, this um, very palpable understanding that um, human mind is limited and human pretensions to knowledge are limited. But be that as it may, okay, so it's like, again, this is somewhat haphazard, so let me uh, um, uh, maybe uh, leave this point to one side and try to, again, try to <laughs> get back to Foucault's of course, hermeneutics of the subject, but not there yet, not there yet. <laughs> it's kind of endless uh, de uh, deferral, <laughs> trying to get to Foucault's course, <laughs> never quite getting to it. So, but again, um, running the risk of going astray, you know, and turning this into a sidetrack of a sidetrack of a sidetrack, still, I want to say a couple things. So I suppose kind of like the most immediate occasion for me to start thinking about Foucault once again is that customarily in the second semester, we begin the, um, the, the course, well, we begin the um, discussion of the uh, classical uh, European 
philosophical tradition. And there is a certain very robust narrative about how this tradition is supposed to be developing, right? Which begins uh, maybe to some extent with the Renaissance and Reformation, but certainly, certainly like a very important privileged point of beginning for this new modern Western philosophical, European Western philosophical tradition is found within Descartes, right? And so there's a certain story that gets told of how we go from, um, um, from Descartes to, yeah, okay, so I, sh I, sh I should have probably uh, uh, left this slide up. Maybe, maybe I'll come back to it, uh, the long scientific revolution. Um, um, but there is the story that goes from Descartes basically to Kant, right? And we go through um, um, we go through Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz on the continent, the continental rationalists, and then we go through uh, uh, you know Locke, Berkeley, Hume. Although I'm quite skeptical of both Locke and Berkeley. Uh, and, you know, it's like in, in some sense, if I were telling the story, I would prefer maybe to start from Hobbes and then go straight to Hume from Hobbes. But that's, you know, a matter of preference. But importantly, importantly, within the standard textbook account, the two uh, lines of reasoning, again, the continental rationalists with uh, Descartes, Spinoza and Leibniz and the British empiricists, uh, maybe Hobbes, uh, Locke, Barclay, and Hume. You know, these two lines are supposed to converge and coalesce in the figure of Immanuel Kant. And uh, uh, often, sometimes, you know, uh, in some of the textbooks, this is actually referred to as this epistemological turn of how... Um, uh, so, the problem of knowledge, the problem of skepticism comes front and center. Uh, uh, epistemological turn, which is the idea that issues of epistemology come to uh, dominate over questions of ontology or questions of ethics, right? And, and very importantly, Immanuel Kant supposedly, presumably, is supposed to have solved uh, these great dilemmas and arrived somewhere. And um, to a very large extent, um, I am not a fan of this approach, okay? So I feel that... Um, this narrative needs to be challenged and maybe needs to be substantiated. And I am not sure if there is a, uh, a valid uh, substantiation of this narrative, right? So, of course, this is, you know, these are big philosophical question, questions and there are high philosophical stakes attached to them. And in no shape, matter, or form uh, do I expect people to just buy into my way of looking at things. Um, and so, but, but I guess like as a, pro well, as a proposal, but as a proposal, I'm, I'm fairly confident about this proposal in my own head, which is not to say that I'm prepared to defend this proposal right here, urbi et orbi. And this is kind of, again, this is almost, almost getting now to the hermeneutics of the, hermeneutics of the subject, because one of the reasons I want to read this uh, book, which is again, which is a transcript of the <laughs> lectures that Foucault delivered in the Collège de France. Presumably, Foucault wanted to write a book um, based on the lectures, but unfortunately, lamentably, and tragically, Foucault died, died too early uh, um, to finish the book. Um, but at the same time, we do have the lecture courses, which is great. Um, so, anyway, so what I'm driving at is that the kind of philosophy that we see Foucault develop is radically different from this standard story of uh, um, you know, a philosophy that gets told that often begins with Descartes. And by the way, when you begin a philosophy course with Descartes, there's always a bit of an, like, an uneasy um, question, you know, what did you do with the Greeks? What did you do with the medieval scholastics? And you know, different uh, professors and different courses, different textbooks have various ways of dealing with that. But as, as, as long as the kind of the high road of philosophy is supposed to start with Descartes and end with Kant, both the medieval scholastic traditions and the like ancient Greek traditions have to somehow be relegated to some sort of you know subordinate role somewhere outside of this tradition. Not to mention that, of course, again, the philosophers who would come after Kant and maybe out fall outside of the Kantian tradition, philosophers such as uh, Hegel, Marx, Nietzsche, Heidegger, and Foucault himself, um, 
you know, will it's like there's just I feel there's just no real good way to fit them within this narrative from uh, Descartes to Kant unless you're willing to like really shoehorn them in and uh, at the end of the day um, do you know do do quite an injustice to their project right and um, so actually. Uh, yeah, so let me, let me, let me, so again, Foucault, in, I mean, Foucault had this uh, interesting uh, way of defining his own philosophical project, and Foucault likes to talk of himself as a certain ha kind of an heir to the Kantian project, he has a way of uh, presenting himself as a continuation of Kantian philosophy, and, you know, <laughs> that may or may not be true, I feel that Foucault is really doing this to some extent just for rhetorical reasons, and um, like keeping that in mind, keeping in mind that Foucault himself found a certain way of, of looking at his own philosophy as continuation of Kant, what I'm going to talk about right now in the next moment is going to be in some sense like a, a, like a repudiation of this picture and of attempt to think of Foucault in an entirely different uh, 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 trajectory through an entirely different prism. And again, this is, this is, this is why I have this book in mind, Hermeneutics of the Subject. Because it begins at the beginning. It begins at the beginning of Western philosophy. It begins with the, the Plato's dialogue, Alcibiades. Incidentally, um, and um, this is kind of a, uh, this is a point which is important and not important at the same time. And the point is whether the dialogue Alcibiades is really Plato's dialogue. And the answer is it's complicated and scholars disagree. <laughs> And, uh, um, um, you know, it's not important in the sense that I don't want to, you know, waste time. It's like I want to talk about Foucault, not about Plato right now. So who cares? Uh, but on the other hand, I feel what is like what is really important and what Foucault does and in the way that he presents a history of philosophy and the kind of history of philosophy I guess I want to teach is a history of philosophy that tries to focus on the important pragmatic questions of uh, um, having philosophy ask um, questions which people care about, like f philosophy as activism, philosophy as a way of life. Again, this presumably ancient ideal of philosophy as therapeutic, of philosophy being to the soul what medicine is to the body. And as long as we think of philosophy as deeply practical and as deeply therapeutic, of course, we shouldn't care about who wrote Alcibiades. We should not care. The only thing we really care about are the kinds of arguments that, that are contained in Alcibiades, right? And so, um, mm, so this question of Plato's authorship is important, but it's important in the negative because kind of it, it shows a whole um, swath, right? A whole uh, huge side aspect, I don't know, of the philosophical enterprise, which is if you become a professional philosopher, this is what you obsess over, like who wrote the dialogue and what does the dialogue say precisely, right? And this is, to a large extent, I feel not what Foucault does in the hermeneutics of the subject, because again, like, again, he is, in some sense, he is, right. again, he is writing a history of uh, Western philosophy, a different history of Western philosophy, an alternative history of Western philosophy, when you don't talk about, you know, Plato as some kind of a proto-Christian, Platonist who obsesses over the theory of forms. It's, it's a different kind of Plato, right? And you can debate whether it's true or not true uh, um, uh, to Plato's original character, uh, like, until the end of eternity, right? And the, the, the question are, is, what are the stakes? Now, of course, in parentheses, let me note, I'm not in any shape, matter, or form, I'm not suggesting that this kind of historiographical uh, or historical philosophical enterprise is useless. No, 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 no. Of course, I think it's very important uh, uh, to read the text carefully and to have these kinds of arguments, arguments of authenticity and arguments of what Plato really meant. I think it's deeply important. Um, but at the end of, and it's like, for all sorts of reasons. One of the reasons is because um, very often, or you know, as a matter of course, well, let's say very often, what this leads to is uh, uh, a, a richer understanding and a richer appraisal of what the philosopher thought, a philosopher like, let's say, Plato or like Epicurus or Epictetus or Marcus Aurelius, like we, we, we end up with a richer context, with a richer uh, 
picture of what the philosopher had in mind, right? And, but, but, at the end of the day, I want to say that this is an instrumental goal because we don't study Plato just for the sake of studying Plato. At least most people don't. At least, you know, and there's something to be said about that, right? Um, we study Plato because we think that the arguments are good, right? And a richer, uh, more, you know, full, more complete understanding of ancient philosophy allows us to see the arguments more clearly or maybe different kinds of arguments. But at the end of the day, the arguments are more important than, um, I feel, than the kind of the attribution, right? So it's like if, if we read Plato and we find a, a novel, novel way of reading Plato, which informs our lives and which is useful and wonderful and productive in all sorts of ways, but not true to Plato, well, you know, Again, as a, uh, uh, you know, I feel that it's good to know <laughs> that that kind of interpretation of Plato is probably not true to the original Plato, but the arguments are still valuable, right? So, so a, what I'm saying is that like a, a, a more superficial reading of ancient philosophy may still be useful, uh, um, you know, may still be useful for the kinds of arguments that it provides, like a misreading of Plato or a superficial reading of Plato or what have you, and. Um, Part of, the, part of the reason why I'm introducing this thought here, of course, and again, I, I said that this is going to be chaotic and this is me talking about everything at the, same, at the same time. Like, ideally, I need to listen to my own speech right now and go, <laughs> uh, like, type it down, make a summary of what I'm saying, restructure and, and say it again, right? But anyway, so, you know, this is, you know, uh, uh, live speech, uh, uh, thinking out loud. Anyway, um, uh, uh, let me let me go back to this issue of uh, um, uh, the, the truth of Plato's philosophy or, or the lack of, I mean, of accuracy of Plato's, or sorry, of accuracy of Foucault's readings of the ancient philosophers. If I ever get around, which I hope I will, <laughs> to actually doing a series of uh, 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 lectures on hermeneutics of the subject, I am much more interested in the way Foucault reads the ancient philosophers. The, I'm much more interested in the way that he reads them. In the readings that he proposes, I'm more interested in the arguments, in the sort of the worldview that emerges from Foucault's reading. I'm more interested in that than to the, the extent to which Foucault's picture is actually true to the ancient philosophers. So it, it may be an interesting enterprise to compare uh, what Foucault says about Plato's Alcibiades to what Plato's scholars say about uh, Plato's Alcibiades, or to compare what Foucault says about Epictetus or, Sen or Seneca or Epicurus to what modern scholars say about Epictetus, Seneca, and Epicurus. It might be interesting, it might be instructive, but to a large extent I am interested in what Foucault is saying for its own sake, okay? And I don't want to be kind of naive and facetious about this. It's, this isn't just, you know, claiming kind of the death of the author and kind of it doesn't matter uh, what the original text meant. No, 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 I do think that it's important what the original text meant and it does make the conversation richer. And I think it's important to keep all these um, uh, nuances in mind and um, not sure exactly, uh, institutionally speaking, how the course could be organized, but in principle it would be nice if within the course we could have students um, um, who would do, let's say, projects and, and try to uh, fill in these blanks. And again, as we are reading Foucault, also some people are going to you know, go and double-check, uh, uh, cross-check what Foucault is saying against modern scholarship. Although I would imagine that in principle <laughs> it would be uh, an enormous effort, right? Um, not really, you know... Ideally, I, I, under the ideal circumstances, this isn't really a task for a presentation or an essay or maybe even a coursework, but more like a, a, you know, a task for a, for, a, for, a, for a proper dissertation, right? Comparing, let's say, again, uh, 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 Foucault's reading of uh, Plato's Alcibiades to the dialogue itself. Um, but be that as it may, be that as it may, I, what, what I'm driving at ultimately is I feel that, um, um, again, there's, there's value at looking Mm -hmm. There's value of looking at the way Foucault approaches these problems and uh, the way he frames them. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, this has actually gone for quite a while. And I'm, I'm sort of circling around 
all sorts of topics without actually getting into the meat of the discussion. I wonder if I should maybe uh, break the stream here because, you know, this, <laughs> this has turned, turned into a very vague introduction and I haven't really gotten to any of the major points I was uh, looking forward to. So, hmm. Let me just think. In the interest of some, in, in the interest of some sort of narrative coherence, um, yeah. Let me let me again. Let me maybe break the stream here, and we'll restart shortly. Ah, uh, yeah. I see some people in the chat. Yes. Good evening. As always. 